I've spoken quite a bit about the emergency alert system in my videos, and last year I even showed what happens when we get our required monthly test from the State Emergency Operations Center. Let's expand on that. This video contains valid tones and sequences used in the emergency alert system. Do not play any part of this video on a radio or television broadcast to avoid violating Part 11, Section 45A of the FCC rules. The emergency alert system in the United States has its roots in CONELRAD, meaning Control of Electromagnetic Radiation, which was a Cold War era system designed to warn the American public of a nuclear attack by bomber planes. Its only intended use was for a national level emergency. In the early 1960s, as missiles replaced planes as a means to deliver nuclear weapons, Conrad was replaced by the Emergency Broadcast System, or EBS. The EBS resembled today's emergency alert system more closely than Conrad did. In Conrad and the early years of EBS, the activation signal was accomplished by turning a radio station's transmitter off and on repeatedly. Vacuum tube-based RF amplifiers of the era were frequently damaged by this, and broadcast engineers begrudgingly called it the EBS stress test. And so the EBS introduced something called the attention signal. Two sine waves, one at 853 Hz, and another at 960 Hz, played together to form a rather unpleasant tone. This attention signal remains in today's EAS and is only used in commercial and educational broadcast stations. By contrast, NOAA Weather Radio All Hazards uses a single 1050 Hz tone as their attention signal, which sounds like this. The structure of EBS also looks more like today's EAS. To throw off bomber planes, stations participating in Conelrad would broadcast on one of two frequencies in a round-robin fashion so the radio signals were coming from a different location every few minutes. The EBS introduced the concept of primary and participating stations, operating in a sort of daisy chain where down-level stations rebroadcast what they receive from their primary stations. Not only does this general structure exist to this day, non-participating stations in all three systems have been required to completely stop all programming and turn off their transmitters in the event of a national level emergency. In the 1970s, state and local authorities, as well as the National Weather Service, received permission to activate the emergency broadcast system on a smaller scale in response to localized emergencies like chemical spills and severe weather. These alerting sources had agreements in place with a primary station in a local area to originate messages in the emergency broadcast system. Participating stations were allowed to ignore state and local activations of the EBS. The only one they could not ignore was a message from the president, which was and is still called Emergency Action Notification, or EAN. By the late 1980s, the flaws present in the EBS were becoming apparent. Inconsistent procedure documentation and inexperienced radio station operators led to widespread criticism of the system. FEMA, the FCC, and NOAA all worked together to develop some improvements, and on January 1, 1997, the emergency broadcast system was replaced by the emergency alert system. The structure of the system was modified slightly from the EBS. This new multi-tiered structure allowed for logical entry points into the system, and NOAA Weather Radio All Hazards was officially included as a message originator. At the top is a network of 74 primary entry point, or national primary, broadcast stations, as well as a handful of national PEP sources like Sirius XM. Every one has a direct link to the FEMA Emergency Operations Center in Virginia. The vast majority of broadcast PEP stations are clear channel AM stations with large coverage areas that make them easy to directly monitor from other participating stations. Each state's emergency management agency submits a plan to FEMA and the FCC designating statewide primary stations and at least two local primary stations for specific geographic areas. EAS participants in these local service areas are required to monitor at least two local primary stations and usually encouraged to monitor the nearest NOAA Weather Radio All Hazard Station serving their location. The local primary stations must also monitor the statewide primary stations and the PEP station serving their area. The most visible change in the EAS, at least from the standpoint of the general public, was the addition of the Specific Area Message Encoding Protocol, or SAME. SAME is used to start and end every message sent through the emergency alert system. 
It was developed by the National Weather Service in the early 1990s for use on NOAA weather radio all hazards to allow users of weather radio receivers to control which locations activate the radio's built-in alarm. Previously, the 1050 Hz warning alarm tone would activate every weather radio receiver in the broadcast coverage area, leading to fatigue and disregard of potentially life-saving information. Same headers that precede EAS messages may sound like erratic buzzing noises, but it's actually a digital stream of data containing information about who the message is coming from, what is happening, a list of locations, usually counties or county equivalents like parishes or independent cities, the length of time the message should be considered valid, the time of issuance, and the station or source relaying the alert. This data is encoded using something called audio frequency shift keying. This just means the binary zero is one frequency, 1562.5 Hz, and binary one is another, 2083.3 Hz. Each bit is only 1.92 milliseconds long for a data rate of 520.83 bits per second, so it's difficult for humans to hear anything but the weird buzzing noise. And if those audio frequencies sound oddly specific to you, that's just because the tone for a zero is three cycles of a sine wave, and the tone for a one is four cycles, all in that 1.92 millisecond time frame. Since this is a really simple protocol without much resiliency, the data is transmitted three times so the receiving devices have a better chance of decoding the message. I won't go into too much technical detail here, but you can think of it as a really slow modem on a noisy phone line. I think I'm showing my age here. The most valuable feature of SAME is the ability to convey when the emergency message is finished and normal programming can resume. In the days of the emergency broadcast system, every broadcast station needed an operator on duty 24-7 to watch for and rebroadcast any EBS message received. Sometimes it wasn't clear when the emergency message was finished, so it was up to the person at the participant station to figure out when they could stop relaying programming from their primary station. For a real-world example of this, there is a video on YouTube of a recording from WHAS in Louisville, Kentucky on May 28, 1996, as tornadoes struck the area. You can hear several instances where the board operator activates the EBS attention signal to send emergency information to other stations, and sometimes it's not very clear when they move out of important emergency information and back into more news-type coverage. In today's emergency alert system, the end of every message is clearly defined by what is called the end of message, or EOM code. It's just the same data encoding as the header, but it simply encodes the letters NNNN, sent three times. Every broadcast station participating in the emergency alert system must have a device something like this. This is the Digital Indec by Sage Alerting Systems. The other major player in this space is the DASDEC by Digital Alert Systems, but they both do essentially the same thing and they both comply with Part 11 of the FCC rules. On the back of the device, you have pass-through ports for your station's program audio using analog or AES digital connections, a network port, a terminal block to connect your monitored audio sources to, and a variety of I.O. In radio broadcasting, these devices are designed to be placed in line somewhere in the air chain so they can take over the program feed when activated. Thanks to that design and the same protocol, most stations no longer need a person in the building 24-7 to handle emergency broadcasts. It's all automatic now. Any stations designated as a primary still must have someone on duty, but that's the cost of being a primary station. The rules and procedures within the emergency alert system are similar to what they were in its predecessor, the emergency broadcast system. In EBS, every station was required to activate the attention signal and read a test script once a week. In the EAS, this is called the required weekly test, and you've probably heard it before. It's just the same header and end of message code without an attention signal or audio message. Every station participating in the EAS runs this test. Weekly tests are not forwarded, just logged. A full EAS test message with attention signal and an audio message must run once a month, creatively called the required monthly test. These are usually originated at the state level and inserted at the state primary stations, which then filter down to local primary stations and the rest of the participants. Stations are required to rebroadcast any required monthly test they receive within 60 minutes. The only other message that is absolutely required to be rebroadcast is, unsurprisingly, the big one, the Emergency Action Notification, or EAN. 
This is used as a last resort when the President of the United States needs to be heard on every broadcast station in the country now, so everyone is required to rebroadcast it immediately. One of the criticisms of the emergency alert system is its redundancy on the national level given the rise of the 24-hour news cycle. As a result, the EAS and its predecessors have never been used for their originally intended purpose. Of course, this also means that no one knew how the system would behave if it was ever needed. In 2011, the FCC wanted to find out, so they scheduled the first national test of the entire system. This was a live code test, which meant FEMA would originate a message with the EAN event code into the PEP network, just like they would in a real national level emergency. It was chaos. The audio quality is horrible. You could hear the alert start over in some feeds, so you had this weird echo effect. There was a lot to improve on, but at least we knew what would happen, right? The second national test in 2016 was a way to see how these improvements were going. Notable changes here were the use of a new National Periodic Test, or NPT, event code, and a location code of six zeros, ostensibly meaning the entire United States, instead of the location code for Washington, D.C. used in the first one. EAS equipment is required to process and rebroadcast the NPT code as if it were the EAN code, so the effect was largely the same. In addition to the 2011 and 2016 tests, national tests were run in 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2021. The next one is scheduled for sometime in 2023, so be on the lookout for more information later this year. I have another video on my channel with a recording of several stations in my area during the 2021 test. It's an interesting listen. The emergency alert system has a long history, and it's always improving. FEMA also now has a parallel internet-based feed called the Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, or IPAWS, that every EAS participant also monitors. Sometimes we get our required monthly test through that path before any of our local primary stations rebroadcast it. I want to thank you for watching and supporting my content. My goal is to teach you about broadcasting and broadcast engineering with the hope that more people will consider it as a career path. It's a lot of fun. As always, I'll answer all the questions I can in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe and ring the notification bell to see more stuff from me, and visit airwavearchitect.com for links to my social media and other things I talk about in my videos. I'll catch up with you next time.